welcome everybody tonight and hope uh, this will be a profitable study. Um, we want to look at, to at least begin looking at the, uh, the attributes of God. And now remember, we're speaking of, this will be a little, little bit review. We're speaking of the one God. And when we say that, that's synonymous with saying the one essence. And we spent some time last week on the Trinity regarding the three persons who make up the one God. And thus we know why we can call uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> because they have the one divine essence. The one divine essence has them, to put it in a common way. But just as a triangle is one triangle, but with three sides, that would be the essence of a triangle. Now, if we consider taking one of those sides away, then it won't be a triangle, and it won't be the essence of a triangle. So when we speak of essence, it's like speaking of the nature of God. The nature of the triangle is three sides. The nature of, of God is three persons. And those three persons make up the one essence. So there is a mystery there of how it all works. And uh, nevertheless, we can, as I said many times, accept the fact of a thing without being able to, to really um, understand it. Uh, grasp it. We can know some things and not understand all there is about it. But I uh, say all of that to say the, the, the guideline we want to use is they're not three gods. There's only one God and he has uh, three persons. That's why you can talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to talk about the, just for a moment, remind us of the eternality of God. God has no location as we think of us located in time and space. And he is not material at all. We've learned already that he is a spirit. He is really the spirit from which all other things flow in the sense that he made them. And again, we can ask, well, why are we here? Why did God do it this way? Could he have done it in another way? Well, since he did it the way he did it, there's no use asking, could he have done it another way, except to say uh, he has the power to do things the way he wants to do it. It's in harmony with his essence. Now, God cannot do something that is contradictory to his essence. Uh, God cannot... Uh, Make a weight that's too hard to lift. That's just impossibility. So it's like God cannot lie because he's a God of truth. So he can't lie. We need to understand that because he is eternal, that he inhabits eternity, but he also inhabits every place he's created. Again, do you understand that? Do I understand it? No, I really don't. But there are some passages of Scripture I want to give you now for you to study later on. If we read all of them now, it would take up too much time. But these Scriptures are the essence of God uh, as far as the eternality of God. First of all, it's one come to mind probably most often to be Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. But then also, I would give you Psalm 90 in verse 2. Psalm 90 in verse 2. And in the New Testament, Ephesians 1 and verse 4. I'll mention those again. Genesis 1, verse 1, Psalm chapter 90 or Psalm 90 in verse 2. Ephesians 1 and verse 4. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 1, 17 that he is the eternal one. Now notice there, the eternal one. Well, I thought we said there's three. No, there's only one divine essence. There's the eternal one. And if there's the eternal one, there's the eternal three because uh, deity is not made up. 
of two or one persons, deity, the essence of God, the it's eternal, is made up of three persons, and that they 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 exist as that or in that way, without beginning or ending, which of course again continues to be uh, an amazing thing as far as uh, what as far as we're concerned, because from the earliest times. Uh, of our lives, once we begin to think about God, then one thing that will fascinate us from the earliest time we can think about him to, I guess, the day we die, if we have our mind about us, is the fact that he does not have a beginning and he does not have an ending. He just is. I am that I am. Um, and that makes it very uh, difficult. I would say above all things, that's a that's something we don't plummet and don't grasp, but we accept the fact of it. And we don't want to get into a situation where we ever contemplate God as a man, as a human being. Uh, you say, well, what about Christ who became a human being? Well, that's different because he became a human being. And you say, well, how, how did the Father and the Holy Spirit know anything about uh, what it is to be a man through Christ? It's, it's the easiest way to say that is that uh, since they are one, since they are of the same essence, Christ gave up the form, whatever that is, of the eternalness of God. Um, in the sense of a form, he didn't give up his uh, being as God. But when he became a man, uh, then he uh, experienced, you could say he had experiential knowledge. Beforehand, he had, of course, omniscience, or all that's knowable, he knows. Whatever is knowable, he knows. So he knows man as he created him. He had to, he had to know what he was doing uh, to create him. But to experience being a man, he did not until Christ experienced being a man. And that makes him then have the ability to be the mediator, the only mediator between God and man, because he is God and man. And a mediator must be able to understand the differences, if you want to call it that, between two. And thus he can because he became a man. And he, as we've said many times, I guess from the beginning of this class, uh, he never he never gave up his humanity. That's God uh, never giving up his humanity, which one of the Godhead three, the second person. And in the second person doing that, he became the one that could be the judge. He became the one that uh, would understand man. So the grace of God the favor God offers man, man doesn't deserve, and God's love of us, which we don't deserve because we left him. He didn't leave us. We left him in transgressing his will, thus by sinning, 1 John 3, 4, and that goes back to sin entering the world when Adam and Eve sinned. And of course, it's very clear, as we're studying on Wednesday night, that all have sinned, you come short of the glory of God. And that's what separates us from God. Romans 6, 23. Thus, we have to have a way back. Well, we're learning about how this, uh, the God who does not have beginning or ending is a triune God. And that uh, he exists in the three persons. No that there is not a separation between his, his essence and the nature of God from the three persons. It's just the way they are. And we can say it this way. It's the way he is. So grasping that is one thing. Accepting it, yes, we can accept it without fully understanding it. Um, when... When we ask, maybe this helps a little, I don't know, it does not, but there are a number of places in Scripture that are like this. If I were to ask you tonight, 
on the last great day of judgment, does God judge us? Well, yes, he does. But he does so through the God man, Jesus Christ. We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive the things done in the body, whether good or whether bad. So God is judging us, but he does so through the second person of the Godhead who became man. He's the only mediator between God and man. And thus uh, he can judge us and exercise the mercy and grace of God to those who've loved him and obeyed the gospel. And thus, through him, through Christ, we are acceptable to God. So you understand maybe better when Christ says, one of the scriptures we're very familiar with, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, or unto the Father, but by me. So again, to try to understand how that works, I can't but I can accept the fact of what I just quoted. And if you read a lot of things like that, when it comes to God, then you'll, you'll be able to accept it because God is in three persons. I would suggest that's probably the best way to say it. God is in three persons. Not three gods, but the one singular God the one divine essence is in three persons. Thus, the three persons have the nature of God. And it's shown to us through the attributes of God. So when one person of the Godhead does something, that's God doing it. And that's important to realize that when the Holy Spirit revealed the New Testament through the inspired writers, God gave us his word. Thus, it's the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, but it's the New Testament of Jesus Christ because Christ revealed the New Testament through the Holy Spirit. And thus, God, the one God, revealed the will of God through the words of the Holy Spirit or the words of Christ. So when you get down to just exactly which person of the Godhead has done things, that goes back to the comments we made last week of, of um, the, uh, well, I guess I'd say of each one doing, having different assignments. I don't like the words I have to use, but again, uh, they have a role to play, each one of the Godhead three. So we will be judged by God, but it'll be through Jesus Christ. We have the will of Jesus Christ, but it's revealed by the Spirit. That's his part. And uh, when you have uh, God the Father, then Christ said, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, who gave it to him? Well, we may not understand why he has all authority, except for the things I've just said about him becoming a man, remaining a man, and a glorified man now. And thus through him, we have someone who understands the plight of man because he became man. That's what the Hebrews writer is talking about when he talks about a high priest who is touched by our infirmities because he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And he, he couched that in the thing the Jews knew best because they lived under the law of Moses and the priesthood system, which had the high priest. So all of that was all in shadow of the real thing to come as far as Christ was concerned. Let me speak now a little bit of the omnipresence of God. What I'm going to point out here is that the attributes of God actually relate to the time, through time, and creation. And in doing so, they set uh, the one God apart from 
all other beings. And they cause, I guess this is the way to put it, they create a, a deep humility in us and a reverence as they ought to. One thing I would say when we, and this means a lot in teaching our kids and so forth, people have sometimes lowered God where they just speak of him as it's the neighbor next door. That's why we have so much talk about reverencing God. And this helps us reverence God when we understand the attributes of God, because he's so high and above us, and there's none higher. He is the one true and living God, and he's not to have his name taken in vain. I hear every day, People we'll take the Lord's name in vain. They take God in, in vain. Well, to take something in vain is to use it in a way it was never meant to be used. That's, I wish we would think about that when it comes to what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. It is blasphemous to do so. It really speaks against God. When we don't keep him, even by use of his name, uh, in the high and holy place that he ought to be. So I would say in studying the attributes of God, it would be very important to emphasize how they exalt him as he is, and thus far above us and far above his creation. Um, Isaiah 45, 21, we'll look at for a moment. There is no God else besides thee, or me, excuse me. There's no God else besides me, Isaiah writes, a just God and a Savior, a just God and a Savior. Isaiah was inspired by God to say, and to speak, and to write in God's place. And thus he would say, there's no God else besides me a just God and a Savior. Our sense of justice basically comes because part of that imprint on our spirit that God Father has a sense of justice because God is a God of justice. You can't have a perfect, flawless judgment except by God. That doesn't mean we may, can't make judgments that are adequate, that, are, that cover the matter, but we're talking about how he reveals himself and knowing the secrets of men. There's nothing hidden from him. And I think that ties in with the fact, too, that God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. I may know a person is guilty of a, of a crime and conclude on the basis of adequate evidence and credible witnesses that he's guilty. But I don't know all of what went on in that person's life, what went on in his mind. I can know a thing's wrong without knowing all that goes on in the attitude of the person. Um, in fact, a person may have a very sincere attitude. I'm sure there are people all over the place who worship God with a mechanical instrument when it comes to singing and they're just as sincere as they possibly could be. But people don't realize you can be sincerely wrong. And when you're wrong, you can tell it. How? I know what God's authorized for worshiping him in song. And when I see somebody going contrary to what he's authorized, I know he's wrong. That doesn't judge you sincerely. So God knows all those things. The same would be true regarding members of the Lord's church. A person can be worshiping as far as I can observe. A brother in Christ, sister in Christ may be worshiping as far as I am concerned because of what I witness and what I can't know. He's right. I don't know what's going on in his mind. He may not be worshiping God in spirit. His mind may be on something else completely. 
So I can't know all those things. God does. And so there are those things like that that I'm glad to let rest with God because I can't know all that has gone on in a person's life or in a person's mind that produces whatever's going on. I know those, uh, those things can be because I know what's said about rearing a child in the Bible. And I know that our being brought up by godly parents can make a difference, but not always. But I know it's part of what ought to be done, ought to be done because it's authorized. It's the way God wants us to live as parents to our children. But again, as parents, I can't know all that's going on in my children's mind. I can't know how they're paying attention to what I'm doing. I do know that if I set a bad example and I don't train them up the way they should go or I don't rear them in the nurture admonition of the Lord, that I can't be helping them to be right. But there's individual people with a will and they may not pay a bit of attention to what I do. They may like the way the neighbor's kids live because they are ungodly or whatever it may appeal to them. They are they're individual. I'm just I'm just taught that as a parent, I have an obligation to them to set a biblical example and to treat them like the Bible says children ought to be treated and to teach them rightly and so on. Now what they do with it later on, I don't know. Uh, but you're giving them the wherewithal to draw from things that can help them live as they ought to be. So we have to recognize those, those things. We can't know, but God knows every bit of it. God knows how your children are receiving your, the example you set, how they're, whatever example they choose to follow. So God knows all of that. That may help us in understanding something about this business of omniscience. Um, so we can again say that he's incomprehensible, yet we can know certainly enough about him so our souls can be saved. We can know the will of God concerning that. Uh, so, well, a good example is Jesus saying, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. And you learn from that then that you can't be what you ought to be as far as God is concerned without obeying him. He's the author of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Hebrews 5, 7. Um, understanding again the, the fact that God is eternal. I think, um, again, let me emphasize, is most impressive to us when we give serious thought to it. Um, read Psalm 90 in verse 2. I will do that before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalm 92. Well, the implications of that is, is that there never was a, uh, a situation without God. And, that this God is eternal. Thou art God. Well, has there ever been a time when he wasn't God? No. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And he was God before the world was formed, before he ever created anything, spirit, being, or the world, a place for man, and then created man. He was God. And then here is this statement by Paul, to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only true God. There is the only true divine essence. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Again, 1 Timothy 1, 17. I think one of the most uh, sublime descriptions, which uh, has to do with praising God, is found in the very last verse of the one chapter book of Jude. 
to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power before all time and now and forevermore. So to realize that about God should make us reverence the very thought of God in our mind should make us be sure we don't ever adopt any slang words that would really be blasphemy to such a one and uh, does not represent proper use of his name. And that's why the Jews did uh, back when, I don't know how far back, would not use the word. Um, Yahweh. I might mention as a side note here concerning usage today. You may not know this, but Jehovah was a word that came in the English language because men wanted to say the word Yahweh. And they came up with Jehovah. So Jehovah, the word Jehovah, the English language has been around, uh, I don't know, may have been around eight or 900 years or 500 years, but it hadn't always been. So they, they did that. And the American Standard Version, when it came along, used Jehovah more than, uh, more than it did Lord. What uh, Lord usually translates is Adonai. The Jews today would would call him Adonai. And they will not refer to uh, Yahweh as far as uh, the actual Hebrew spelling. Now, we don't know what it actually said, how you actually pronounced it. Not even the Jew today knows it, who reads Hebrew fluently, uh, Old Testament Hebrew, would know what that meant because it, they left the vowels out. And when we say Yahweh, we are saying uh, basically what we've come up with because somebody back down the road put in the vowels. I don't know who it was. And, you know, you can't pronounce a thing without vowels. Um, so that's the Jews' effort to show that they hold him in very high esteem, though they would not even pronounce the word. And it comes out Yahweh. And I'll say this too. I've noticed over the past number of years that more and more in the place of Jehovah, the name Jehovah, it's appearing in the writings of various people, Yahweh. They're seemingly moving from Lord and from Jehovah to the use of Yahweh. You may know that. I don't know. But it's when I grew up, I wouldn't know what Yahweh was. I, I didn't know Jehovah. And you see it in the Psalms. We sing, hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heaven, praise his name. So that's one of the things that's happened as a sidelight to our discussion, the main theme of our discussion, that's happened regarding uh, current writings among denominational people and others. They're going to Yahweh rather than Jehovah, Lord. But the Jew commonly referred to God as Adonai. That was their word for him. And so in their minds, that did not uh, show irreverence to say Adonai. It just meant they would not use that word because they actually referred to God, which we've learned to say because we added the vowels, Yahweh, and we knew. So that was their idea of exalting him and not using his name in vain, but there's all sorts of ways to use the name in vain. I don't know how many people will say, Lord, have mercy, and they don't even think about God, and they say it, or they'll cry out, my Lord, this kind of thing, and besides this uh, more crude ways that they've used it, uh, I sometimes hear it on television, actors portraying a part, and uh, this primarily comes from Roman Catholicism, and they'll talk about um, 
in a swear way or an exclamation, Jesus married Joseph. Well, uh, all this kind of stuff. Or they'll say, Jesus. That comes from Jesus. And so there are all sorts of things that we need to be careful about because when you study God and you realize his highness and his holiness, then we ought not use his name except where it ought to be used and the way it ought to be used. And uh, there are a number of things like that when it comes to obeying Christ, saying let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I suppose we're living now in a time when more people use corrupt communication than about any time. And so in the church, we must be mindful of the holiness of God and reverence him in our actions and in the usage of his name. Isaiah uh, spoke of God as the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, Isaiah 57, 15. And through Moses, God said of himself, and I've mentioned this all through our course, I am that I am, Exodus 3, 14. Christ in Revelation 1, 8, in referring to himself, said, I am Alpha and Omega saith the Lord God. Now think about that for a minute. We talked about the one singular essence of God being the one deity in three persons who possess that. And he, he says, um, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, saith the Lord God. Saith who? Saith the Lord God. But what person is speaking? Jesus. So it shows you how that when one of the Godhead three does something, God does it. He says who is and who wants. And who is come, the Almighty, Revelation 8. So we need to understand his eternality. We need to know that. You say, well, I can't quite grasp that. All right, just accept the fact of it. Right now, you can't, you don't know the details of just how your computer's working. Somebody may know it, but I don't. And I don't think you do. But you accept the fact of it, and you use it so that you can benefit from it. And you know you can't benefit from it. You don't turn it on. And you know you can't benefit from it if you don't uh, use what's necessary for a computer to understand how it works. And there's been a whole host of times people with computers, more times than we can imagine because it's frustrating us, when we're trying to get something done and uh, it's not responding to us. Well, if things still working like it was made to work, that means we're not speaking its language. We're not typing in what needs to be uh, typed in, or I could say uh, keyed in. So it, it, it'll do what it's told to do when it's working right. So we learn that. But do you understand all how that works? Most of us don't. And there's a lot of things like that when it comes to living life. Uh, again, God is not subject to time. And uh, when, you, when you think about that, that he's not subject to time. In fact, he created time. You'll call it all to an end someday. One of the things is that uh, this explains why he waits. It appears to us he's waiting. Um, but you can't, you have no way. Well, we're here located in time. We're waiting, uh, let's just say it this way. We're waiting as Christians for Christ to come back. That doesn't mean he's waiting in the sense that we're waiting because he's not subject to time. But he made time. And what he's doing pertains to us who are bound by time and space and material things. So what other way would you use it from our perspective? Is that... Uh, we're waiting. Christ is waiting, but that only pertains to time. So to say that Christ is waiting or God is waiting as far as performing his promises, it's not the same. And if you look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, chapter Peter 3 and verse 8, you'll see that helps us maybe to understand 
uh, the keeping of his promises. Uh, you know, if you say, uh, well, so-and-so's in a hurry. You can't say that about God. You can't say that God is slow. He just is. So that's why Peter says he's as a, a, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. He's trying to communicate to us who are bound by time and space and material things that these things don't matter to God. They don't govern God. Now to us, they do. So it's, it's like he's waiting. But to say he is waiting like we would wait on something is not the case. So when you come to that, that's another one of those things. How do you comprehend that? Well, I don't comprehend it. I just accept the fact that it's that way. And thus, I understand that when I die, that I step out of the governing powers of time and space and material things. And I'm governed by whatever governs spiritual things. It won't be us. It won't be the way it is here, I mean. So uh, I know for those who die saved, as Abraham said to the rich man concerning Lazarus, uh, now he's comforted. I know Jesus called a place of departed spirits of those who are faithful, paradise. So it's a place of, of rest. It's temporary, but it's a place of rest because it's temporary because we're still in our spirits. Now, this is one of those cases to where the Hadean world will last as long. Here, watch our words because we're limited. Will last as long as does the earth. Because the spirits of dead people are in Hades. The people who are lost are in torments with the rich man and all others who are wicked. What separates them? Well, Luke tells us in Luke 16, a great gulf. And actually, Jesus is telling us, and Luke inspired, wrote it. Then separating it, no, no one can't come from one side to the other. There's paradise where Abraham is and where the rich man was. Or where the, where the uh, Lazarus went and where Jesus went. And Jesus came back to the world in the same body he was in we, that died on the cross. Might mention here, that's one of the proofs we have because if he hadn't come back in the same body, why would you believe it was him? That's why that you have the record of, of Thomas who said, I won't believe unless I can put my fingers into the holes of his hands and into his side where he was speared. Well, when Jesus came back, he said, here they are. Be not faithless, but believe. He followed before him and said, my, now notice what he says, my Lord and my God. Um, this in itself tells us that Jesus is always the God man. Although when he goes back to heaven, he's glorified. Now, if you ask, what does it mean to be glorified? <laughs> I don't know, except it's a you almost have to use the word to, do, to try to describe it. It's a glorifying situation. If nothing else, you are um, in the situation that Jesus is in. That's why John says we do not know what we shall be like, but we will be like him. That's as good a way as I can explain it. In fact, that's the Holy Spirit inspiring John to say that. And that's the Lord's will. So trying to explain heavenly things, spiritual things, as they are in the spirit situation right now, is uh, really quite difficult. Thus again, I say, I don't know how many times I've said it, we have to accept the fact of it, whether we understand all of it or not. I guess it's just, as we go through this, it's just a natural thing for us to contrast the eternity or the eternality of, of God 
with our own brief existence on earth. Um, what will it be like in, in even the spirit world of paradise, but especially when all this is ended, been consumed with fervent heat, doesn't exist anymore, the judgment's over, we're glorified humanity in the presence of God when we remember what it was like here. It'll be such a brief thing. That's the reason it ought to serve to people who aren't interested in God to stop and think about their particular situation. They know, every atheist knows, that they are going to die. Now, how they deceive themselves and many of the things they do, I don't know, and I don't want to learn. But their desire to oppose God, rebel against him, and teach that he doesn't even exist creates a frame of mind or an attitude that is about as deceived as a person can be because a fool has said in his heart there is no God. And Romans 1 makes it clear that we can determine through general revelation in nature that there is a God and that he is capable of doing what he's done in the creation. So that goes a long way if you sought and meditate about that um, toward telling us much. But again, I'll say you cannot know the will of God for us on earth except by revelation. That's the only way you can. Uh, I've said it many times. You, you can contemplate um, an oak tree all day long. And you'll never learn the plan of salvation. It may cause you to look for the God that made that oak tree and know that there is such a God he would communicate with his creatures since man is one of his creatures and he made him to think and communicate. Then you might start looking for that God who communicates with his creatures. Remember how Paul started off on Mars Hill. He found the altar to the unknown God. And he said, uh, who are you ignorant and you worship? I'm going to declare to you. And he even says in, in his sermon, God's not far from any of them, which means God wants to be found and everything about this life is designed to help man find God. And once you think there is a God who created all things, the next thought ought to be, what if he said anything to me? And that uh, means that God can be found and his word can be found if you want it. Here's the key. How much do you desire to know God? Um, the Lord make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is. Let me know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as handbreadths, my lifetime as nothing before thee. Surely every man in his best estate is altogether vanity. Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5. Psalm 39, 4 and 5. Now, tie that in with the New Testament in James 4 and verse 14, where he says we ought to do this. What is your life? Well, it's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Of course, that's our life on earth, the life in this, in this physical body. I'll close um, before we go to the questions with this poem by William Knox. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? Like a swift fleeting meteor, fast flying cloud, a flash of the lightning, a break of the wave passes from life to his rest in the grave. Of course, that speaks of our time in the body. And thus, there's a little time. And the older you get, the more you realize that. The more, I think more for the, for the Christian who's truly faithful, as you get toward the end of your life, you start thinking more about, well, what's beyond? And all those things you've lived for years preaching and teaching, 
regarding God and man's duty to him becomes more real than what the present world holds for anybody. So we'll terminate class here. <laughs>